So Alf, for someone who's still relatively young, it feels like you've been around the angling scene for quite a few years. Tell us a little bit about how you first got into it. It all started years ago when I sort of used to go to the countryside with my dad and on family trips. And he used to go fishing with my uncle years and years ago. He's got photos of fishing over places like Farlows, catching skimmers, like, you know. And he used to take me and I was a bit of a wanderer. I used to do my own thing, go newting, frogging and stuff like that. And I sort of got more into the fishing during like the six weeks holidays. Um, and as I grew older, when I used to come back to London, like after the summer holidays, being away in the countryside, I used to be more eager to go more often. And it so sort of got to a point where I was asking my dad and my uncle to take me. And as I got older, sort of 11, 12, becoming a teenager, I used to then go on my own, catching roach and stuff growing up. And then I started obviously walking um, around some of the local lakes near my, near my home in North London and seeing the carp spawning in, in the summer holidays when I, I was like 10, 11. And it sort of got, got on from there. I thought I've got to catch these. Like, and that's how it sort of grew. So you've obviously lived in London all your life. And I'd imagine, you know, back when you were young, going on holidays and that out into the countryside, you know, it, it was lovely. But coming back into London and fishing those park lakes and that, especially with someone so young, what was that like? You know, was it a bit challenging or intimidating or was it just because it was your, your neighbourhood, was it absolutely fine? I think because it was where I grew up, it... I was oblivious to it being anything other than normal to me. It was just me going fishing to my local lake, as, as it would be anyone's if, if they lived in the countryside. So it, it was natural. Don't get me wrong, I, I wasn't really night fishing then when I was like 11, 12, only if my dad was there or as I got to know some, some local people that fished over the parks local to my home. It was only five minutes away that then my parents would allow me to do nights with these, these, low, these fellow anglers that they'd obviously met and sort of said, keep an eye on him. And it, it was all normal and it, it still is all, all normal to me. So when you've been doing it all your life, it's, it's, it's just the norm really, isn't it? So obviously you, you, know, you started catching quite a few carp back then, but have you got a real standout memory? There's one one trip that, that will always sort of lay in the back of my mind as, as a great memory. Me and my dad, we missed June the 16th fishing on, a, on the local park. It used to always get, get busy, like ridiculous. These, this small, lovely old pond, there was only four swims on it. It's about an acre and a half. And people used to camp in them weeks before, obviously, the start of the season. And we went to Egypt on a family holiday and, and didn't return until, until 10 days later, two weeks after the season had started. By then, everyone had, had gone home. Not much had been caught because of the pressure. And we thought we'd do the weekend fishing, eager to go. A f an electrical storm come over that night and we was both sharing the, like the bivvy, doubling up, me and my dad. And this old Fox Micron just ripped out of nowhere and I just rem I just remember literally bolting out out of the bivvy and uh, playing this fish in in the rain it was looking back a ghost carp of about 14 pound like everyone's after the ghosty when, when they first fish somewhere aren't they and you, you're young I'm not too fond of them now but it was a target back then and the session just seemed to get better and better I ended up catching the big one, which was 34 pound, old, crusty, 40, 45 year old carp, you know. And then the second biggest one, 31 pounder, and my dad had a couple. I had a double figure tench, a couple of bream. I think it was like 130 odd pounds worth of fish we caught in a couple of nights, like we added it up to. And yeah, got, got the photos from when I was, I think I was 12 or 13. So. 
yeah, there's, that's a pretty, pretty fond memory that I always keep. So you had that brace of 30s when you were just 12 years old. 10 years have passed since then, and obviously during that time you've caught a lot of special carp, a lot of them from the London Park Lakes. I get the impression you always fished fairly short sessions due to the nature of the fishing. But how, as a, having a family, you know, has that affected your fishing much or is it still the same? Definitely catching them carp sparked something that is still with me today. I realised that they, they were the ones that I wanted to catch, them old lovely dark fish. And being in the location I was, there was only certain venues that I could catch carp like that, which meant a lot of the time I was doing short sessions and moving from venue to venue. Although back then I had more time on my hands, I could sort of bait and fish most days. I would never do long sessions anyway, so my, my angling style hasn't really changed. It's just I don't get enough time to fish various venues like I used to. Right here, look, wish. My dad. Yeah, go on, make a wish. You're supposed to blow it. <laughs> you blow it, will <laughs> see you. I'm sort of focusing more on, on one venue and putting all my time, because it's more precious now, it, into that, so to speak. But I, I'm never sitting there behind, behind rods for days on end. I never have. So I don't think that's, that's going to change. So compared to a lot of people, Alf, it might be seen as quite difficult to document your fishing because you, f you flit around a lot, like you say, it's short sessions, opportunistic stuff. What's, what's the sort of the whole angle behind that? I'm never one to sit behind rods for, for days on end. I'm sort of trying to grab an opportunity when I can on certain venues, whether they be high stock or low stock. Always fishing's been for myself, so I've never really worried about that. I've kind of just gone on what I want to do. There's been no pressure, so if I want to go there, I'll go there. If I don't want to go and I want to stay at home because it's raining, I, w I won't go. It's all to do with timing for me. I will put more effort into baiting and waiting for that good, that good weather front to come in to go and then hopefully catch three or four carp off, off that baited area that I've been baiting for a month, even if it, if it is a low stock water, and share my captures with, with the public because they're beautiful fish and I want to share them, not because I have to. If I wasn't in the public eye, I, would, I wouldn't have not caught the carp that I've caught, just people wouldn't have seen them. So I like to sort of relate to that. It's, I do it because it's, it's for myself. And that's why the flitting around is, is so sort of involved with my own fishing, because it's, it's what I like to do. I'm not forced to do anything or held down to a, a, a committed certain lake or ticket for days on end. You might have noticed that I only put half of my bag of bait that was left over from, from this week's rolling in the bucket. That is only because it makes it a hell of a lot easier when coating them with liquids, mixing it up and adding some, some powders. Um, just makes life a, a, a lot easier. You always get it when you, you make up a bucket of uh, seed or something and you have your hemp, your tigers, and then it, it gets to three quarters of the way and then you put your corn and you're trying, <laughs> you're trying to mix it up and all, all the corn and everything's coming over the top. So it just makes it a little bit easier to do it in in smaller amounts, but them extra five minutes just means that you get it how you want it. Last year, I was baiting a section of river close to my home, just with nuts and some off bits of boilies from here every week, like, you know. And I baited for quite a period of time, waiting for a good bit of weather to drop in. And like I said, I liked to bait for a while. It wasn't my, my main sort of attraction, but I knew there was some lovely carp in there, not massive ones. And I knew at, at the right time after I sort of got them a little bit confident visit, visiting a certain area that I'll be able to drop in and catch a couple of carp. And hopefully Jack could have come and, and filmed them as well. Killed two birds with one stone. I suppose in the city, you've got a hell of a lot of variety, you know, rivers, canals, obviously the park lakes as well. But I would imagine 
a lot of people are generally put off fishing rivers and canals where they might not necessarily know what's in there. What do, what do you think to that? I totally agree. I, I think it's, it's pretty daunting as well. There's it, fishing canals and rivers in the city with towpath traffic and boat traffic is ten times what you'd get out, outside of outside of town. So you've got all that to compete with. Rush hour, you can't you can't fish them canals and and rivers. Like the towpath is is ridiculous. You've got pedal bikes going past you left, right, and centre. So it's not only the carp that's there to put you off. It's, it's other challenges as well. Lakes is sort of always listed what, what lives in them. The rivers, you, you just never know. You just never know what might, might turn up. I've put a little bit of time into them, knowing that they contain lovely old carp and a few surprises as well. And it's, they're definitely not for the faint hearted, but it opened your eyes because I've actually caught carp that tails caught out of the Thames from, from the River Lee close to my home and they've traveled miles and miles and you just think, you just never know what might turn up here one day. And that's why I think the unknown and the not knowing draws me in, but it tends to put a lot of people off. Also, they're not the place to really be wandering down of a night time, the canal towpaths. They can be not the safest of places as I've, I've found out in the past and had to sort of angle around that. So there's lots of things that get thrown at you and that's why I think they're overlooked. You obviously place quite a big emphasis on pre-baiting Alf and helping Spence out at Aqua Baits. You know, you're around bait all the time. But what's your sort of philosophy on bait? Is it sort of horses for courses? I suppose most people thinking he's around bait all the time. He's got access to tons and hundreds of kilos of, of boilies, but in reality, it's not like that. I will take little odds and ends, what's left here after helping out, do you know what I mean, rolling the bait. They should come to this, man. I put my own time, money and effort into baiting up as well when, I, when I'm pre-baiting somewhere. It, it's not always with boilies, it might be nuts, it, it, it might be buying maggots or casters. So it's not all boilies and pre-baiting. In a matter of fact, a lot of the big carp that I have targeted, because I've wanted to catch them, I've narrowed down my approach to mainly is stalking with a bit of free line bread. Do you know what I mean? To, to make sure that I know the carp that's eating that bait is the one that I want to catch and I'm, I'm watching that happen, which I love. Pre-baiting is something that I do when I want to catch a couple of carp and I've not really got a mega target or I'm, I'm going onto a new water and it's, it's obviously whatever comes along comes along. Um, but yes, it's not always piling bait in and sitting behind it or 10 kilos and two rods out for the night, you know what I mean? A lot of effort and time goes into it. It's lovely under that tree. A lot of my baiting's done around, I don't want other anglers to see it, canals, rivers especially, you, you're baiting and you, you like to know whether the bait's being eaten, so you, you're going down along the canal towpath having a look, oh the bait's gone, like they must be eating it, but there's a lot of anglers now, a lot more than there was 10 years ago in London. And I have to now bait to around sort of that, making sure no one can see it. But unfortunately, like on with the river, the carp do give themselves away sometimes and there's nothing you can do about that. You, you can be baiting for a while and then someone has a walk up and down and they, they see a couple of carp bubbling and jumping and they're gonna fish for them. And unfortunately, that's what happened. The day I went down to go to the fish the river, a couple of, couple of fellas obviously see the carp. They give themselves away. And I think they had six fish that morning. And I'd been baiting for nearly a month. But that's carp fishing, eh? What can you do? So what do you do when it all falls flat like that, Alfie? 
I suppose there's not much you can do, but sort of pick yourself up and think where you're going to head next. I've got a list in my head of loads of venues, some not necessarily even in London, with lovely old carp, and they don't have much history. They don't have to be massive, but I, I'm not even afraid of traveling now I drive, just as long as they sort of float my boat and they're what I like fishing for, I'll, I'll travel and, and go for them. So, what an absolute corker. I took a trip to the countryside, a bit different to my London home, fishing um, a beautiful big pit. And uh, as you can see, what a beautiful fish. Just the type of unknown ones I love fishing for. Now, sort of coming more up to date, Alfie, last winter, I know you went through a bit of a rough patch, didn't you? And you sort of lost your appetite for fishing a bit. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it was, it was sort of something that came out of the blue. Everything boiled up from a long winter with not much going on and injuries and being sick and some other stuff that leaded to a lot of anxiety. I was having panic attacks and just wasn't feeling myself. Fishing was completely out of the window and I had some, some sort of sense of fear when I'd think about things. Even going fishing, I'd, I'd feel really feared and scared. When in, when in reality there was there was nothing to be scared about, and sort of lockdown as well. The coronavirus didn't help because that that made it a little bit more lengthy. But I started to get out more, going on walks. We actually got a little puppy just before lockdown, which was planned to help help myself get out more. Unfortunately, we we went into lockdown, but I could take him out and was walking and doing little bits and bobs, thinking about fishing, which was obviously a, a progression to, to what how I felt in, in the past, come off of social media for a while as well. And I was just starting to feel a little bit better. So, sort of, when we wasn't really allowed to go fishing, I was starting to get the buzz back and start to think about what my plans were ahead for the year. Uh, still going through it, through some some bad thoughts at this stage, but there, there was progress, which I was happy with. And yeah, when the lockdown lifted, it was time to start getting out and seeing what what really was going to happen this spring. Once lockdown lifted and we all got the green light to get out again, it was it was time to start doing some fishing, getting my fishing head back on, which was making me feel a lot better with myself. Oh, that's a different type, this one. Yeah, it's more thin and flat. And managed to catch some nice carp, some lovely commons I was catching close to home from a low stock, uh, low stock lake that didn't have much history. And we actually was filming a little bit of it at the time, but my mate accidentally, the, I was going through footage and deleted the footage of, of one. And then the next time I had it set, recording to to get this fish out of the water and said to my friend oh like it's rolling basically so we got the shot of me getting the fish out going to lift it and as i've lifted it he's obviously pressed stop where he's thought he's pressed start so we missed that as well so it was all all a learning curve with filming some of my own fishing documenting it and getting out and feeling a lot better That's big, you know. <laughs> but there was there was one fish that that kept kept nagging me in the back of my mind, and I was just waiting for that right time to to go ahead and get a plan underway. But I definitely wasn't going to be messing up the filming with this one. So, mate, that sounds interesting. You got a fish in mind? How did you find out about it? This fish, particularly. It's, it's a funny story because me and my, my good friend James walked this particular particular lake cool, about 10 years ago now and we, we didn't see nothing so we sort of wrote it off. And I was barbel fishing a couple of years back and my friend Chris said, oh, have you seen 
seen the carp in so and so, this this particular venue. And I said, no, like he, he was fishing for, for perch. I said, oh no. I said, oh, what have you? Like, have you caught, caught any? And I always heard of carp there, but never ever known, known anyone to catch any or seen any photos. And he said, yeah, I had this this massive red fish follow out a lure from under this tunnel. I was thinking, I said, how big, Chris? And he, he's, not, he's not a fool, he knows a big fish. I said, how wide was it? And he said it was like that. I said, so, ooh, 40 pounder, mid 30s? He said, definitely mid 30s. He said it was red, as red as you like. I said, that sounds interesting. But I always remembered that. I didn't, I didn't in that period of time go and check it out but I always remembered that I will be back and I will look. There was some plans that I was trying to go build up to and I mentioned to someone my plans. I said, oh, I'm going to go have a look at this, this bit of water. They, they knew, they had perch fished it. No, nope, not carp fished it. And I said about, I've heard of a big carp, I'm going to go down there and have a go for him. And unfortunately, during lockdown, it was caught. Cool and I learned that now loose lips sink ships and I shouldn't really have let off that information. But I wasn't fishing at the time, it was, it was locked down and I was just coming up with plans. But as soon as that lifted, after, after knowing that, that he was there, I, I knew that I was gonna be, gonna be having him. I know you really got the bit between your teeth about this fish. What was it that really wanted you to make you catch it? I think it was the fact, I've had this in the past before with, with certain carp, that they've eluded me and evaded me. I walked around it years ago. I knew about this, this particular water from, from 10 years plus, but he, he wasn't, he didn't show himself when, when I visited it. And after thinking, cheeky he was there all that time that I, when I knew for sure that's that's when I really wanted to catch him and obviously observing I could see that he ticked every box he was old as the hills dark as you like no history just just everything that you could ever imagine a carp to be or want a carp to be that's that's what he was so without giving too much away, mate, tell us a little bit about the venue this fish lived in. Was there, was there many other fish in there? It's a little bit low stock compared to what I'd usually, usually go for. He, he lived with one other carp, another male carp, two males, in, in a very funny water. You had two lakes connected by, by a big pipe. And they seemed to spend a lot of time in one, the shallower, weedier one, but they could, they could, if they wanted to, go through. But they never seemed to obviously live in there because the, the natural food was more abundant there. And he only had his mate, so it was always gonna be him or him that I caught. And I had to sort of figure an approach that I, I didn't wanna have to spend loads of time and nights fishing for, for that one bite. In reality, the other fish was a small common, low double. Beautiful old carp, you know, but not the main prize. And I wanted to approach it where I knew, like I explained, that when I'm after a big one, I wanted to see him take that bait. So I knew stalking was probably gonna be my approach. When the weather was good, get down there, find him, and try and catch him. But he did give me the runabout quite a lot. It did, did take me quite a few trips before I sort of worked everything out and gauged what, what he'd done before, before I knew that I'm going down here today and I'm having you. After a while, it started to become a bigger picture of what was happening down there. The more I spent, the more time I spent down there. And obviously the main prize was him, but that little common was just a lot more hungrier and feistier than the big one. He was more wise. There was this little inlet where they would sit, sort of tasting the water coming in from, from the other lake, but that wasn't the pipe they moved through. That pipe was under, underground. And I, I was trying to stalk the big one with a bit of, bit of bread flake, 
and the common actually come up and snatched it the only time when when the big mirror was interested and sh showed a little bit of oh what's that he come out of nowhere and took it took it from um, beneath beneath him so I kind of let him drift off open the bare alarm I thought no I didn't want to spook the mirror because he looked really interested hoping that that he'd spit the hook and and thankfully he did so I wound in they were still both sitting there the common come back in and I, I, I then again put another bit of crust on. I thought, I'm having him. He, he's hungry today. Dropped it in and the common come straight up and took it again. And I was like, oh, I just have to, have to hook him now and play him in. So anyway, the mirror drifted off, played this common. He went absolutely mental. Like he's probably never been hooked before. And the big one drifted down the other end. And I played him in, got him in. Lo lovely old male common. And the big one actually started to, to show a little bit of interest in feeding down the other end. So I knew that day I'd still maybe have a chance. Is he yeah. filling up the camera? Yeah. He's nice, man. So I fished on and sort of towards the evenings, I was doing evening trips now and I always had one chance in the evening. He had, he had taken my bait a, a few times by now and I'd miss, miss struck or just, just messed it up. And that, that evening it was getting dark and I, I freelined a little bit of sinking bread flake in front of him and he turned around and, and snatched it. And the line, the line twitched and I struck and the hook just completely come out of his mouth and he bolted off. That was another night done and dusted. So I usually just tie, tie a big hook on when I'm using bread. Something that I know when it does go in, it's got a slim chance of falling out. And with a Palomar knot, I know that the Palomar knot is one of the strongest, if not the strongest mono to, to hook knots you can use. So the confidence with that and a big hook, this is a size four gripper, is just just total confidence that, that when I do hook that fish, whether it be a fish of, of a lifetime or, or something small, it's, it's got slim chance of coming off. And especially with the way I hook my bread, which I'm gonna show you in a sec, is, um, is why, we, why I use this big hook. The line that I use is, especially when I'm targeting something that I wanna make sure ends up in the net is, is 15 pound synchro. It's quite brutal and obvious really for, um, f for free lining bread. If you're floater fishing, you'd drop down to a lighter hook link, something a little bit more inconspicuous. But when you want to make sure that, that the fish isn't going to break you off or if it goes in, in any weed and snags, especially when it's your target fish, this, this is the way that I, I'm fishing for my target, free lining and watching him take the bread. I want to make sure that, that he's not going to break me off. So that's why I use this strong thick line, total confidence, and you just know that, that you haven't got no faults in it. Are you using massive chunks or little chunks or what? It all depends really. Sometimes I'm using big bits of crust. Other times it can be small bits. Depends on what, what the fish is taking. I've noticed that sometimes I'll go, oh, well, let me put a big chunk on, he, he won't be able to miss that. And sometimes he, he'll pick off a little bit that's broken off and I think, well, he's only subtly eating the small bits and then that's when I'll, I'll adjust and put something smaller on. And that's happened a few times. I'd pinch off a corner so I, I can get quite a bit of, of white, fluffy dough bread, as you would call it, yeah. the, the inner. To, um, to create some kind of weight, pinch it. It's still got loads of buoyancy. And, and when you feel the weight of that after, after one dip, you can, you can free line that 15, 20 yards. And uh, it, it sort of, as you know, bread becomes very soft and it, and it falls off pretty quick. So once the fish takes it, you, you strike straight out, straight out into him, like, you know? You're hooking it just straight through? I, I hook it literally straight through the crust. And as you can see, look, that's, that's me giving it quite a few tugs and it's before it, before it pulls out. So it, it stays on for, for a couple of casts. And you're relying on 
the strike pulling the hook clean out of the bread. Yeah, I'm relying on the strike, obviously. I notice a lot of the time I'm, when I strike, it, it's more I'm waiting for the fish to eat the bread and not take the bread. I know that's, that's the same thing, but when you actually observe and watch a fish, I've had the fish take the bread and he spit it out straight away. But when he goes to eat it, that's, that's when you, you hook him, like, you know? So you want to see the, all of the white get completely engulfed? Yeah, you want to see the fish take that, turn and swim off without spitting it out. Couple of seconds, wind down it and you're in. Not just, not just snatch at it. What's that takes it, spits it out. You want to make sure that he's eating it. And what do you do if, uh, if they're shying away from that but they're taking smaller bits? I will just literally do the same with the crust, but I'll pinch a smaller bit, st still give it a, a decent squeeze, because you'd be surprised how buoyant that is. Literally just hook the, f the hook straight through it, give it a little dip. Obviously it doesn't go as far, but you, you, you're not fishing any further than as far as you can freeline a bit of bread. Everyone likes to try and conceal the hook. They worry about that, you're, you're thinking... The bread expands, so the hook still does get, get hidden. These carp I'm fishing for, they're not necessarily expecting to be caught or, or a bit of, bit of food to have a hook inside of it. So the, the big hook and the strong line, like I explained, is, is to do with wanting to land the fish that I'm hooking because I'm seeing it and it's generally a target, you know. I think I'd racked up five or six evenings. And it's always hard. I think maybe he was caught this way before. And he, he just knew, he knew sometimes when you was there, but I'd worked out now that he liked to feed down the other end and what, what he would do when there'd be the best chance of, of him taking a bit of crust. So I returned in the morning and I had the whole day ahead of me. And it's funny because like again, they was there at the inlet like they always are in the mornings and the evenings. And he, he sensed that I was there, I think, he, he drifted off down the bank. There's a few bits of free line bread just dotted about that I'd, I'd cast out and they'd drifted around. And he actually, as he was cruising along this, this shallow margin up towards the end where he'd done most of his feeding, he come up and took a bit of bread off the surface. It was nice and bright and sunny. I could see the bottom everywhere, really shallow. And I thought, it's game on today. An hour passed and by now, my friend had gone elsewhere around the other side of the lake lure fishing. So he wasn't actually following me about with a camera. He, he was just having his own little bit of fishing elsewhere. So I'm, I'm walking down. I didn't even have the net with me. It was about 100 yards down the bank and I'm walking, stalking, stalking him. F casting little bits of free line bread in his path. Sometimes he'd change direction and miss them. Other times he'd go up to him, suck where it was so shallow, he couldn't write himself properly and suck, miss him and carry on. I think this happened for about an hour and a half. I was chasing him up and down the bank for, and I was down to my last slice of bread. I noticed that if I had the bread too big, he, it was too buoyant, he couldn't suck it in properly. He had a really snub nose, so he's almost feeding like a barbel, really underslung mouth. He's sort of turned and he's, He's gone to look at this, this little bit of bread flake that's just sitting below the water, the surface of the water. And he's, he's just sped up towards it. And I, I thought this was really unnatural. I thought he, he's, he's spooked off something. I don't know what it is, but he's really quite a placid old carp. He, he wasn't really spooky like that. Do you know what I mean? He didn't have no quick frantic movements. It was sort of out of the ordinary. I'd learned what he was like now. I'd been there quite a lot. And he just slowed down before he got to the bread flake and absolutely engulfed it. And I knew this time that just by the confidence in what he took that bread that he was eating it. So I gave it a couple of seconds, wound down, struck. And after missing him quite a few times, it was proper trembling to actually see that rod hoop over and be in contact with him. This, this fish, he actually came out sideways where it was so shallow and half of his flank rolled over. So he sh his head's come out and he's rolled over. And if I had had the net there with me, I'd have probably been able to scoop him. 
But where I had to shout my, my friend to run round, he, he just took off and he just literally towed me about 80 yards up the lake, which is, it's only a small pond, but he towed me up and down the margins. I had some, some falling in trees down to my right, about 40 yards down. There, there wasn't much of a problem, but they was the only thing that could have potentially been dangerous. So he's sort of heading towards there and having confidence in strong line and a big hook, I know that's very rare that you're gonna pull out of them. Sort of give it, give it one of them where it was like, oh, and he managed to start coming back. And when, when he started coming back then, I knew that it was time, he was done. And I sort of brung him in and when he went in the net, it was a relief. I think I called you Dave straight away, didn't I? I said, I've got him. Like it was, it was one of them moments in angling where it was nice to have captured it by myself, experienced all that. I was just there, although my friend was there, he was miles away, do you know what I mean? He was hundreds of yards away. And by the time I called him, he run back. But there, seeing him take that, that bread, it sort of, it made me realise why I go and fish for these, these sort of carp and why I do what I do. You just can't beat it. Perfect. Well, look at him. 35 pound of old, historic, but unknown carp. How old he is, I don't know. How long he's lived in there, I don't know, but I'm gonna get him back now and hopefully he can live long and live on forever. There's no words for something like that. After feeling the way I felt to then find the buzz and have the love for what I always have had after losing it for the best part of six months was amazing. It made me realise why I do what I do and especially catching them carp that you don't see every day if you've ever seen them before and you don't know where they've come from, how old they are and they're living within 15 minutes of your home, 20 minutes of your home, you just never know what's there, you know? That's the unknown, that's that's what I like and that's what, what fires me up to go. What dreams are made of, eh? Let me get him back. And I think after that, it's made me realise and have a a new sort of view on on my own fishing. It's, I'm not gonna be as as harsh on myself as I have been in the past and determined to get things done. I'm gonna do it how I always have and fish for them special ones that you don't see very often.